Hello and welcome to the latest instalment of Leading Voices, our one-to-one -one interviews with industry leaders from across the reinsurance sector. We're honoured to be joined by Pat Ryan, the founding chairman and CEO of Ryan Specialty Group and a serial industry entrepreneur. Pat founded Ryan Specialty in 2010, but of course he previously founded Aon Corporation and served as its chairman and CEO for 41 years building it to a global giant with 500 offices in 120 countries, generating revenues then in excess of $7 billion. And then in the last decade since founding Ryan Specialty, he has built the platform into a wholesale powerhouse and took it public earlier this year. Pat, in, in little more than a year, you've closed your biggest acquisition with all risks. You've gone public in an IPO and more than doubled your organic growth rate to 29% in your Q3 earnings. Of course, timing is everything in this market, but when you sat out on the Ryan Specialty journey 11 years ago, how did you view the opportunity and did you expect to get here so fast? As I founded the company in early 2010, it was clear to me that there was a great opportunity in building a very strong position as a wholesale broker and a managing general underwriter in the ENS market, that the world was getting so much riskier, and that th those risks would have to go in the ENS market. And there were some tailwinds that were clear, at least I thought they were clear, that retail brokers were growing very, very quickly because of the consolidation of retailers by strategics, but also. Um, by a lot of private equity sponsored capital providers. And so the retail broker was going to be getting larger. And concurrent with that, it was clear that retailers were going to reduce the number of wholesalers they were using. I was convinced of that based on my own experience while at Aon. It just made sense. It was too costly to deal with large numbers of wholesalers. And frankly, it was not a really efficient and effective way to go to market. Additionally, on top of those three, I really felt delegated authority of underwriting, admin, and distribution was going to get a lot of new impetus for growth. Been around a long time. Lloyd's really pioneered it with cover holders decades ago, many decades ago. And yet it was clear that the opportunity for specialty products to get to market through a managing general underwriter had a lot of future merit because it gave variable cost to carriers. It gave um, continuity of management. It gave underwriters the opportunity to be in an entrepreneurial environment and frankly also to be, become owners, which attracted a lot of people that wanted to move into uh, the MGU, MGA space. So I knew it was going to be good. Could I have predicted um, that the market was going to change this dramatically? No, but it was a soft market coming out of the uh, financial crisis and um, looked like it was going to continue to soften. And it did with a couple of blips, but it basically softened. Um, and yet I thought that a new, new venture, um, attracting really high quality people, could carve out a very important market position. So I was very optimistic about our growth, so much so that I made a major investment, our family, my wife and my children and I invested over 400 million to build the infrastructure and attract the talent to really become a major force in the ENS market. So I obviously was very confident or I wouldn't have done that. But it was clear with the world getting riskier that this area of the business was going to accelerate and rapidly. Now, there's no way I could have predicted what's happened here in, starting in 19, 20, and 21. But it is common 
after a prolonged soft market to, in effect, have a hardening. It's not common to have a hard market, but a hardening. But when you looked at the world getting riskier, it was just clear that with, with climate change, with cyber, with social inflation, that the world was going to continue to get riskier. And you needed the freedom of rate and form to meet those risks. So I've always liked the innovative aspect, an opportunity in insurance broking. And that really comes most easily and readily in the ENS market because of the freedom of rate and form. So it all came together as a confluence of events that I actually felt were going to happen. I'm not prescient, but I've been around the business long enough to be able to connect dots to know um, if this is happening and that's happening, then it's likely that these things are going to happen and that's really how it un unveiled. So yeah, the degree I'm surprised at, but not, not the, not the directions, probably the trajectory, yes. Pat, this market has been described as the, the best ever for the ENS sector. Do you agree with that assessment? And, and what are the drivers behind it that are maybe different from the past? The drivers really have been that, the, that London and the admitted markets had taken on a lot of risk that hadn't worked out very well. Um, that was not foreseeable at the time that we started, but it was clear as we got into the mid-teens of this past decade that the market had gotten very aggressive and that uh, there was going to be some pain coming down the road. And it's just a matter of when. It's kind of like, well, you know that interest rates will go up if inflation comes in. You just don't know how high, but you know, not, you'll know they'll go up and you don't know when. So it was clear that both of those had to happen. Rates had to harden, firm and then harden. And then frankly, it was a matter for how long well, the pain got a lot longer and deeper and broader from climate change. Um, you know, frankly, the cyber risk emerging as a relatively unknown source of, of uh, where the claims would come from, which policies would cover it. And then just a lot of new societal change that moved a lot more quickly. So those all came together, and it is undoubtedly the hardest, the most robust and prolonged ENS market um, growth rate that I've seen in my career. Now, we don't know how long it's going to last, but it seems to have legs here. Now, Pat, you, you launched Ryan Specialty after building Aon to become one of the two biggest global retail brokers. With that perspective, how would you say the relationship between retail and wholesale brokers has changed over the last 15 years? And, and what role has that played in the emergence of three dominant wholesale firms? I love the question of the change between um, the past and this current market as it relates to the value proposition that wholesalers bring to retailers. Throughout most of my career, retailers basically thought, well, we'll use a wholesaler for access to certain ENS markets. And if we could get to that market without the wholesaler, we would do that. And that opportunity ebbed and flowed. Um, and there were opportunities to bypass the wholesaler and get to that ENS market directly. Um, but what's happened is that wholesale brokers have attracted and developed 
through training programs and developmental programs, really um, exceptional expertise in lines of insurance and industries that have to be in the ENS market. And as these specialty risks have gotten so much more complex, the need to really be an expert in these specialties has grown greatly. But also the volume of these risks has grown dramatically. And therefore, a group of specialists like we have at Ryan Specialty, but our competitors have some as well, um, really bring a strong value-add proposition to the retailer. If we don't bring that value-add, they're not going to use us. So it's really sort of in our hands um, to keep bringing the value uh, proposition to really enhance through our specialty skills to work with the specialists at the retail broker side and align with specialty underwriters who understand these risks, but who we as the wholesale broker have an everyday relationship with, and they know that we understand these risks. We know what their appetites are. We know what they like to see and what they don't want to see. And so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a truly value-add um, equation now that has changed over the last, and I'd say, it was starting to change in the early part, 11 and 12 in that time frame. Maybe a little bit before that in certain cases. Um, but now it's, it's quite pervasive. I think we're in our, our value. You're now once again the CEO of a public company, Pat, and that comes with its own opportunities and, and challenges, of course. And, and one of those is to maintain the current level of surging organic growth. Is current growth in the ENS market cyclical or a structural shift? And, and if it's cyclical, how do you manage expectations in a down cycle? I'd like to talk about the cyclical first, because it's both cyclical and structural. So on the cyclical, um, it's just really much more extreme than the past, but cycles do change and it will change. Um, how much it reverts back is unknown. Um, to what extent do people who got burned on these types of risks come back in down the road? Unknown. But for the first seven years of our being in business, we were in a soft market. And we grew a double digit all the way through. And we grew a double digit because we had the expertise that was required at the time. And even though it was a soft market, it was, it was very competitive. But they still needed the intellectual capital. So we don't go out of business when the market softens. The needs are still great to differentiate ourselves and help, help the retail broker. They're just at a different scale and a different degree of intensity. What I think is structural is that certain risks, and I would say cyber, I would say a lot of climate change, um, and then frankly a lot of casualty products that where you're gonna be going to trial on, on issues, have found a long-term home in the ENS market. Let's talk about M&A. Uh, so last year you completed a major game-changing acquisition in all risks. Is consolidation now done in wholesale broking? And what are the opportunities in the underwriting management and binding authority space? Consolidation is not complete in wholesale broking. Um, there are boutiques out there who um, need capital. It takes a lot of capital now to be able to serve your client with the appropriate technology. And a lot of boutiques of family businesses, entrepreneurs have said, I, I don't want to commit that capital 
So I will think I'll, I'll join one of the larger firms and uh, take advantage of the fact that they've committed the capital and will continue to commit capital. So there will be a continuous flow of boutiques, I think, into larger brokers, wholesale brokers. But you put your finger on a very important point, which is that binding has not been consolidated anywhere near the degree that transactional wholesale has. So there's a lot more binding consolidation to take place. And then frankly, on uh, underwriting management facilities, particularly programs, um, it's very embryonic uh, in terms of consolidation of, of, of those program, great program companies, which are often privately owned, family owned businesses or entrepreneurs um, who have the same issue on technology. And, um, you know, frankly, it's, it's more than technology because it's access to the brokerage community. And if you're not large enough and have enough critical mass scale, and or the differentiating talent, you're not included in the appointment opportunity, the RFP process. So that's going to drive and has driven people to find a home with a larger broker. So there's a lot more of that to happen. So I, I, we're quite uh, bullish on the future of, of our M&A strategy in uh, boutique wholesale transactional, but particularly binding and program and MGUs. With record multiples being seen on transactions, how do you find value in this M&A environment? Multiples do keep moving up. Um, so they're new record set every year, the last several years. Um, we're, we're very careful on who we buy and what we buy. Um, we have to have a good cultural fit. It has to be strategic. But we have to have a clear path to getting our hurdle rate returns. Now, you have to be competitive. The good news is that you don't always have to be the highest price. We've had the good fortune of buying over 40 terrific companies and sometimes we had to meet a price where a few all got to the same price and then the seller chose who he wanted to go with or she. Um, but you have to be in, it's certainly in the zip code. But people are careful about who they sell to because they, a lot of, in most of the companies we bought, the people want to stay on and stay in the business. And we want that because we don't have the people to just step, slot in there to take their places. But they want a larger platform. They want to have the opportunity for um, being modern and current and uh, technology. But also they want to reach into this wide array of potential retail brokerage opportunities. So we look at what synergies we can get on a cost basis to sort of buy down the multiple. But frankly, the real synergies have come in revenue opportunities. Because in the companies that have joined us, we've been able to get really high productivity increases. So brokers that produce a million a year of revenue relatively quickly get to two million, and two to three into four, and um, so we give them a great opportunity for um, their own progression, both um, in terms of their professional rewards, but also um, you know the financial rewards. Now, as a part of that, there is just no doubt that you can pay too high a price and you can't get to the right final value, as, and so you have to take a pass. And we have, but we don't, we tend not to get very far down the road. 
with people that we think are not going to be meet that equation that we need for a, a full price, but where we can get the synergies to validate that price and get our returns. But we've had a very good batting average. And there's a pretty good activity flow right now, just broadly in the industry on M&A. Now, Pat, there's, there's plenty of talk of a talent crisis in the industry, but over the last two years, you've hired hundreds and hundreds to the Ryan specialty ranks to meet demand in a surging e &S market. Can you tell us a bit about this preemptive hiring strategy? Well, Tim Turner, who's our president um, of Ryan Specialty, but also the chairman and CEO of RT Specialty, um, has always been very enlightened in terms of understanding how long it takes to get a broker ready to be productive. And, and predicting the increase in flow of, of business. And so we have had a consistent hiring program ahead of the business flow. <clears throat> As I said earlier, my family and I were willing to invest the over 400 million in anticipation of this flow. And so that, that just continues where we look at the market and we say, we got to hire. We need quantity to serve our clients. It's a quality and now a quantity, person power business. It's all about talent. And um, it's critical to have the depth and breadth of talent because the brokers are getting so large, the deals are coming so quickly and a wholesaler gets deals late in the game, generally. So you have to be able to respond quickly. If you can't respond quickly, you're not gonna get the business. Or you'll get the order, but you may not keep it. So you need the depth, and you need um, the person power to put against that volume. And we've been quite, quite well prepared for these changes. And I, I give Tim credit for that whole philosophy and strategy. What advice do you have for other companies in the e &S sector to address the talent shortfall and encourage the next generation of underwriters, brokers, and future leaders to the sector? And, and also, what advice do you have for young talent already in the sector to navigate their way to a long, progressive, and rewarding career? Well, I want to be careful not to give too much good advice to my competition our competition, but I'm being facetious. Um, sure, the, the answer is a constant inflow, influx of new talent. New talent inspires existing people, but it gives you that breadth and depth. But it also gives you, if you recruit properly, the ability to take young, inexperienced people out of college and university and get them highly productive. And in three or four years, they can be an expert in a given industry and or product line or combination so that they really bring value add to our clients. And it's one of the most exciting parts of Ryan, especially for me personally, is to see this young talent come in and get mentored properly, get trained and then developed properly and become really true high performing professionals. And so answering that question and adding to it, what advice do I give to these young people? I've said this for a long, long time, for decades. We're working to convince young people that the insurance industry is just a great career, particularly insurance brokerage because you're only limited by your own willingness to work hard, ability to work smart, and being dedicated to the success of your client. And so there's no upward ceiling. 
That's why I got into the insurance business to begin with. Because literally, the only ceilings in this business are self-imposed. So I tell them to learn a specialty. Find something you're really passionate about. Might be healthcare. Might be professional lines. Might be property. But find something you're passionate about and then really do it passionately. Hard to succeed in life if you're not passionate. We want the people that say, let me go, help me get started, but let me get into this game that only I can hold myself back. But you gotta develop the specialty skills and knowledge. Pat, you're, you're, uh, of course, you're an entrepreneur, and the ENS market is often seen as a home of entrepreneurial behaviour and innovation. What opportunities do emerging risks present for wholesale brokers and ENS carriers, and, and what role should the sector play in meeting unmet demand for solutions to transfer risk? That is a very interesting question, and what role should we continue to play? What role should the ENS market play? brokers and underwriters. And the question started with innovation. And what I love about the ENS space, love about the insurance industry, is the ability to be innovative. And you know, the general impression of the insurance industry is it's kind of mundane, it's not exciting, but it's the opposite. And the needs are so dynamic, changing all the time. And they're socially so important in terms of people protecting their businesses, protecting their reputations, protecting their professional abilities, um, solving for healthcare issues, solving for construction issues, real estate issues, the great challenges um, so it's that innovation and the freedom of rate and form. So we are constantly looking at ways to word policies to make them more responsive to the needs of that particular client. That's the freedom of form. Words make a difference, but particularly in insurance. And what's said and what's not said are critical. So an innovative way to broaden the coverage, get paid for it, but to improve the coverage so people don't say, well, I bought the insurance and I'm just looking for an out. No, the really good professionals are looking for how do we solve it for the client so that through innovation we can cover even the most unexpected development of risk. That's fun, that's intellectually challenging. It's f frankly very financially rewarding. But that's the role of the ENS market in my mind. That's the opportunity. That's why I'm here. Would you say risks such as cyber and pandemic and, and even extreme climate change are, are insurable by the private insurance industry? The risks on pandemic and cyber and basically climate change are generally insurable by the private industry. Lockdowns by government really aren't because that's, that's a risk mitigation decision, a judgment made by frankly, political leadership. Um, that's hard to ensure. But so the pandemic by itself, I think can be insured. Now there are certain risks that require a public-private partnership. Certainly terrorism has. But I've been a believer for quite a long time that the industry could do more on terrorism um, than it's doing and that 
it's appropriate that the private sector play the role that it's capable of playing and get ready to play a bigger role. Same thing with flood. We've got the National Flood Program. But I've always believed that the private insurance flood sector needs to be more innovative, needs to have more capital, um, needs to help manage risk better. Now, some of it is not done capable of being done alone, and I understand that. And the federal government has played a valuable role. Um, in terms of other climate change, you know, we have to get used to the fact that one in a hundred or one in a thousand years has changed. They're coming much more rapidly. So we have to, we have to innovate. We have to be prepared. But insurance is basically a private sector responsibility. And economies thrive when they have private insurance markets. And one of the joys and most fun part of my AND career was as we globalized, going into countries like Vietnam, back into East Germany and the Eastern Bloc, and work with them to develop free economies. And you can't do that without insurance. So it was very exciting to see the role that insurance played and plays in developing countries. You can see it in China. And you know, frankly, if you, if you look back through government support, it's really putting it back on the citizenry because they're paying the taxes to pay for the government support. So in my mind, you're much better off solving it in the private sector because at the end of the day, the public's paying for it and they shouldn't have to pay for something that maybe doesn't apply to them. And so I'm basically a free market type person anyhow, but I believe in the private sector. I believe in working with government, but government helping to get more independence for the industry and coming in in terms of crisis. But, you know, if you take claims management of, of catastrophe risks, it's got to be done by the private sector. But there's not enough talent when there's a, a really serious hurricane. The people who suffer the most are the ones that can't get the adjusters in there. So they have the damage, but they can't get back in living the way they should be living. So it's the private sector solving all these issues, the best solution. How do you view the emergence of ESG pattern and what social responsibility should the industry have in the way it operates? I love the question on ESG because it, it's so uh, inflammatory. <laughs> But I believe, and always have believed, in diversity. Diversity of opinion, diversity of background, experience. So diversity of gender diversity, racial diversity, ethnic diversity, religious diversity, diversity of people with typical abilities and atypical abilities. They all have a role in forming a culture to create a prosperous entity, to be innovative, to be creative. And so I, I love the part that we're now really getting involved in as an industry. And frankly, our firm and, and our family has been committed to playing a role in that because it's the right thing. But the other part of it is we have a tremendous need for new talent in this industry. So we should be attracting greater gender diversity. We should be attracting as much diversity as possible because we need the talent. 
and we need their experience, <clears throat> and we need their cultural background. So it's just all very positive. You know, equity I don't want to get into. Equality for everybody is, I think, fundamental to hu human relations. I believe very much in that, and that's a part of what we're all about. But most people are. But as we get to the environment, we all have a role to play. And we have responded in our company back in early 2011, as we saw renewable energy um, really advancing, beginning to advance, and predictably going to advance quickly to bring uh, renewable energy solutions to commerce and industry. So I'm very proud of having been early in that game because it's an important role for insurance industry to play. We also have to play our role in uh, our utilization of energy. So in our buildings, we have to be thoughtful in our um, investments, we have to be thoughtful. And we have to recognize, though, that the pace of all of this has to be managed properly. But I think the insurance industry is playing an important role in ESG, but will play an even more important role uh, in the near term and long term future. Very important subject for the industry to embrace, but it is. You're a serial entrepreneur who, who's made a fortune in the industry that you love, Pat, um, and you've also given a lot back. Can you tell us a, a bit about what drives your decisions around philanthropy and within the industry and, and externally? Well, we're private about our our philanthropy, but it gets public because things get published. So we're not hiding behind it, but we don't like to talk about it a lot, but I'll talk about the why and the what. The why is because I believe in, <laughs> in free markets. I believe in freedom. So I believe in the, the sharing um, of opportunity for education, for um, equal education, equal rights, for uh, employment, equal rights. That just all makes sense, that it has to come from the private sector. Now, the government has to impose that sometimes because the private sector is too slow on it. But at the end of the day, this is all about people. It's we the people. The government just takes some of our money and uh, spends it back. But we believe in education for all. So we've tried to invest in education for all, equal education. We believe in job creation for all, so we invest in that. We believe in higher ed, so we invest in that. Because higher ed has a ripple effect. It's got the great multiplier effect because the great research universities are changing society through their research. You know, biomed, all kinds of research that just improves people's lives, prolongs people's lives. Most people are living much longer than their parents did, and certainly their grandparents. And it's because of medical research and medical care. So we invest in, in medicine a lot, believe in that. Believe that the scientists in this world are just incredibly valuable in what they develop, and what they bring uh, solutions. Um, I also think that, that um, developing in, I mean, um, Creating jobs, helping develop jobs, is absolutely essential. Because people can get a good education, 
but not find the right job, not have a career. And as people move um, up the socioeconomic ladder through education, there's also this need to uh, bridge the cultural gaps in terms of optimizing that now to make it into a career. So we all should be investing in that. And so, yeah, we, we do believe in philanthropy. It's targeted. We do support cultural activities because music, the performing arts, are really good for mankind. They help us all be more civilized. And that's important. So, yeah, you just try to make the world a better place.